Our coverage of the Republican plan to replace the Affordable Care Act continues tomorrow morning. We'll bring you the Ways and Means and Energy and Commerce Committee markups. You can catch them live at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Ways and Means on C-SPAN 3, Energy and Commerce, online at cspan.org. The Republican plan itself was released Monday. While it carries over two provisions from the Affordable Care Act, allowing people under the age of 26 to stay on their parents' insurance and requiring providers to insure individuals with pre-existing conditions, it changes subsidies to buy insurance into tax credits. The Washington Post has a graphic that displays the new age-based structure. A number of House Republicans have called for the elimination of this tax credit. The House Freedom Caucus held a press conference to address their concerns with the bill. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Congressman Jordan and I just left a uh, meeting with the Vice President, and he has assured us that as we look to make this better on behalf of the American people, that uh, the bill that was introduced last night is still open for negotiation and certainly for modification. And we took that as very encouraging news, not because of any particular position that we have, but because it's good news for the American people. You know, I had the opportunity to campaign with President Trump all across North Carolina. And one of the things that he talked about was repeal and replacement. Now, when he said that, it took on two different meanings. A repeal to many meant that we would repeal the entire Obamacare plan, all the taxes, all the mandates, the Medicaid expansion. And when he talked about replacement, it took on another meaning to others, which it meant that we needed to cover the pre-existing conditions, making sure that people didn't get kicked off of their health care plan, making sure that there was an adequate safety net. I can tell you that those two things are still the focus of not only the House Freedom Caucus, but my good friends, uh, Senator Lee, Senator Rand Paul, and Senator Ted Cruz. And as we look at this today, we're going to be talking about a number of of scores in the upcoming days. CBO scores and what score and that this means and what does it mean for the American people. I can tell you that there is one score that the American people will pay attention to. And that is, is does it really lower their health care costs and their premiums? That's the only score that really matters. And if this doesn't do it, then we need to make sure that we find something that does do it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the gentleman from Ohio who plans to introduce a piece of legislation that really repeals the Affordable Care Act. The gentleman from Ohio, Jim Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, Mark's exactly right. Our, our goal is real simple, to bring down the cost of insurance for working families and middle class families across this country. In an effort to do that, we think you have to get rid of Obamacare completely. So tomorrow I will introduce um, the bill that every single Republican voted on just 15 months ago, the bill that actually repeals Obamacare. Our plan has always been repealing one piece of legislation, replacing the other, and that replacement we talked about a few weeks ago is the bill sponsored by Dr. Paul in the Senate and Mark Sanford in the, uh, in the House. Make no mistake, there are three plans out there. There's the Cassidy Collins plan, which is basically if you like Obamacare, you can keep Obamacare. There's the leadership plan that was brought forward which I believe, when you look through it, is Obamacare in a different form. And then there's our plan, the one that I think is consistent with what we told the voters we were going to do. Repeal Obamacare, replace it with a market-centered, patient-centered, doctor-centered plan that actually brings down the cost of insurance, bring down, brings down the cost of health care, and provides affordable insurance opportunities for all Americans. That's what we're focused on doing. Think about this. We put on President Obama's desk a bill that repealed Obamacare, got rid of every single tax, got rid of the mandates, and now the first thing Republicans are bringing forward is a piece of legislation that we're going to put on a Republican president's desk that says we repeal it but keeps Medicaid expansion and actually expands it, that keeps some of the tax increases. That is not what we promised the American people we were going to do. So our plan, repeal it, 
clean repeal, just like we all voted on before, separate legislation to replace what we currently have with a model that we think will bring down the cost of premiums for the hardworking people of this country who sent us here to do just that. With that, I want to turn it over to the sponsor of our replacement plan in the Senate, Dr. Rand Paul. Today I will introduce a companion bill also to Congressman Jordan's plan to have complete repeal, a clean repeal. We'll be doing this in the Senate today as well. There's one thing that has united Republicans. In 2010 when we won the House, in 2014 when we won the Senate, and in 2016 when we won the White House. This doesn't divide Republicans, this brings us together and that is complete repeal, clean repeal. As Congressman Jordan said, we voted on this yeah, last year and every Republican voted for it. That's what we should do again. But we are divided. We have to admit we are divided on replacement. We are united on repeal, but we are divided on replacement. What's the best way to get past this impasse? Let's vote on what we voted on before, a clean repeal. Let's separate out the replacement plans. Conservatives have a replacement plan. House leadership has a replacement plan. I'm sure Democrats would like to go back and vote on the ACA again. Vote on all the replacement plans and let's see what happens. All right, but let's vote on clean repeal. The only way I think this gets done is to separate the issues. Separate out clean repeal from replacement. Let's get it done. Rep repeal unites us and I think we can get that done. With that, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Senator Mike Lee from Utah. What's been introduced in the House in the last 24 hours is not the Obamacare replacement plan, not the Obamacare repeal plan we've been hoping for. This is instead a step in the wrong direction. And as much as anything, it's a missed opportunity. Look, we've seen what happens when Congress decides to put forward a plan negotiated behind closed doors where members are told you've got to pass this bill in order to find out what's in it. It's usually not a good product. And on this topic, I'm not speaking about anything that is necessarily uh, in inherently Democratic or Republican or liberal or conservative. This is just a, a common sense value that what we ought to have in Congress is an iterative process, one in which we can start with, uh, with basic grounding principles. Now, the two parties are in widespread disagreement when it comes to Obamacare itself. But there is one plan and only one plan that has so far passed a Republican Congress. And it's this plan that's being reintroduced today. That plan passed with the support of every Republican in the House of Representatives and every Republican in the Senate. And, and it did so just in the last 14 months. So I think we ought to put this forward. We ought to get it passed and then let's move the ball forward in an iterative process, a process in which people can propose different ideas that will benefit the American people. That's what we want to do and that's what uh, this process, this bill, the 2015 repeal bill, you know, would do if we were to pass it right now. It's now my pleasure to introduce my, my friend uh, and counterpart in the House, uh, 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 Congressman Mark Sanford from South Carolina. Thank you. Um, about a half an hour ago, maybe less than that, about half an hour ago, the White House wrapped up its daily press briefing with the press. And in it, it was instructive in that Sean Spicer said repeatedly, the health care bill that's been introduced is a work in progress. It's interesting that Senator, uh, excuse me, not Senator, uh, former colleague uh, Congressman Price, and now Secretary Price, said the same thing at the beginning of the press conference. It's a work in progress. So if we liken this sort of to Donald Trump's world of everything is a negotiation, what we have now is an opening bid. And I think what conservatives are saying is, okay, that's the opening bid. But based on some things that happened, whether in 2015 or some principles that conservatives have long advanced, uh, might not we constructively look for ways of refining what's been introduced? And that's what ultimately this press conference is all about. I think very respectfully, it's about asking this simple question, which is, do we need to lower the bar in what we believe as conservatives simply because a Republican is now in the White House? So the, the bill that uh, Congressman Jordan is going to introduce is all about simply not lowering that bar of saying, wait a minute, 
this, uh, to their point, 14 months ago was something where there was unanimous accord with Republicans on the House and Senate side. Let's stick with that plan. And it's not just respectively, but it's prospectively as well. In looking forward, let's not lower what we believe or lower the bar on what we believe simply because of Republicans in the White House on new ideas. So you look at the idea of a, a Cadillac bill, Cadillac plan that's based in the current bill that's being talked about. I don't know. Is that a lowering of the bar? You, you, you look at, at, at something like the uh, refundable tax credit. Is that a lowering of the bar? I mean, it was Ronald Reagan that said that the closest thing to eternal life is a government program. Well, guaranteed eternal life in government is an entitlement. And what we're talking about here is a new entitlement. So for a whole variety of different reasons, this is simply about going back to things and principles that have long worked in, on the conservative side and things that Republicans have espoused and grabbed hold of here within the last 14 months. I'm Louis Gohmert, and uh, I guess the newest member of the Freedom Caucus. Uh, we're told we're known by our enemies and we're known by our friends. I'm glad to be known by this group of friends. Uh, all right, I'm glad we finally got a bill out. It's not 2,500 pages. It's, uh, it's a starting point. And some people had asked what I told President Trump when he came down the aisle for the State of the Union. And one of the things I said was, uh, you're being told we can't do some of the things we did two years ago uh, with Obamacare. And it was true, it's still true. So as long as we're able to get amendments to the floor that will fix some huge problems with the bill that's now been filed, then we'll be okay. But uh, they better not be a rule that prevents amendments that are badly needed to fix this flawed bill. Um, that would be a major problem. We don't need, as Mark said, we don't need to start new entitlement programs. And we uh, certainly know, don't need to uh, have the bottom line effect, what Mark Meadows was talking about, that, that prices of insurance don't go down. So there are things that have to be done, that have to be included. But we got a starting point, and uh, I think amidst the uh, horse excrement, we can find a pony around here somewhere. And that's what we're going to be looking to have. I think we'll have a racehorse as long as we get a good amendments when we're done. Right, Luke, David? Right, thank you. Thank you all. I think uh, it's helpful to reflect about eight years back in uh, how we started uh, to do health care reform eight years ago. I think you remember the heads of the insurance companies walking to the White House looking at their shoes, and something was wrong there. And so eight years later, the head of Aetna says we're in a death spiral. And so the health care system they arranged eight years ago obviously didn't work. And so central government, top-down government control, especially at the federal level, does not work. We've seen that. And so now, interestingly, the press comes and say, hey, the car's in the ditch. Uh, how are you guys going to fix it in two weeks? Right? And the answer would always be we should have done free market economics and free market health care uh, in the meantime over the past 20, 30 years. And so last time, what did we focus on? We focused on 18 million coverage. We did not focus on prices or the cost of health care. And so now you have health care costs going up at 25%. Uh, the speaker, right, health insurance premiums, prices, costs going up 25%. The speaker has said the goal is to shift the cost curve down. And so all of you in the press can hold us accountable to that. What that means is not a reduction in the rate of increase, right, not down to 15% growth in costs. A reduction in bending the cost curve down means costs go down by negative 1%. And that's what the American people are dying to see. It's happened in every other market. It happens with cars, CD players started at 500 bucks and go down to 30. So if we would have had the lower costs, I have, we have people sending us examples all the time. $150,000 heart uh, procedure here costs $15,000 in India. That's a radical difference in costs. You could pick up some of that on the uh, pre-existing conditions. It would make that piece of the puzzle much easier to solve if we would have addressed the price and the cost issue. I'll just throw in one more point when we talk about creating a new entitlement program, just so we have the numbers there straight. We currently have a $100 trillion unfunded mandatory spending problem in this country. We promised a hundred of them were able to numbers there straight. We currently have a $100 trillion 
unfunded mandatory spending problem in this country. We promised $100 trillion to the next generation in programs. The federal government has created that problem. Medicare is insolvent, Social Security is insolvent, and now we're going to create another entitlement on top of $100 trillion. So I think in your reporting, that context is very important to lay out, that when we create another entitlement on the next generation, and so one of the goals we have, or at least I have, is I want to push as much of this down to the state level as we can. The federal government being in charge, we have a unique capacity to print money and put debt on the next generation and put it off onto other countries internationally. The states have to run a balanced budget. I trust them way more uh, in the governance to be more fiscally responsible. And so those are some of the major ideas. It's not tinkering around the edges. There's a fundamental philosophical difference about what it means to do free markets, and we want to put in the mechanisms that ensure that that becomes reality. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Garrett from Virginia's 5th Congressional District. I want to thank uh, Congressman Jordan, uh, Senators Lee and Paul, uh, my cohorts in the Freedom Caucus for having me here today. This is simply too important to rush through. The proposals that came out yesterday were shrouded in a cloak of secrecy that denied well over half of the House and well over half of the Senate the ability to essentially participate in the process. And so the debate must be had to fit within the framework envisioned by our founders. We know that historically freer markets, and don't get me wrong, I understand that health care is not a commodity like sneakers, but freer markets lead to lower costs. And we can do this without creating a new entitlement. About a month and a half ago, I believe it's Oxfam, whose research came out that indicated that the eight wealthiest individuals on the planet Earth controlled as much wealth combined as the bottom 50th percentile. That is eight people plus 3.6 billion people uh, had as much wealth as 3.6 billion people. Now, to put the United States' current debt, not unfunded liability, in perspective, imagine, if you will, that we could extract every dime from the entire 50th percentile and down of wealth and the eight wealthiest people on the planet and then apply that to the United States' current standing debt, not unfunded liability, current standing debt. What percentage of our debt do you think that would pay off, folks? It would pay off under 10%. We hear the use of the word unsustainable again and again and again in this town, and some things really are, and new entitlement programs and spending on top of profligate spending truly is, and we can curve the cost curve downward and do so without further encumbering future generations, and it's as simple as that. So I've heard people characterize this as a lot of people playing a lot of games of chicken. We're resolute, and we'll stand here. And we'll do what's right, not just for today, but for posterity. Thank you very much. All right, we'll take some questions. Some Mr. John Parkinson, ABC. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I heard you guys using uh, the optimism ahead that you know the president will negotiate with you. But today he had a tweet that said that you know you term this as a wonderful bill. Do any of you want to use that term, wonderful? And uh, if so, what parts of the bill do you think are wonderful? Uh, no, and uh, there are some improvements in the legislation from the from the leaked draft, but there was a wonderful bill that every single Republican voted on just a few months back, and tomorrow Senator Paul and myself will be introducing that same piece of legislation, and that is exactly as I said earlier consistent with what we told the American people we were going to do: repeal Obamacare. How about using the bill we all supported? and then replace it with something that we actually believe is going to lower health care cost. Mr. Jordan, can you talk for a minute to Mr. Jordan or Mr. Meadows here about, you know, the, you said, Mr. Meadows, that, you know, you met with the vice president. He said, you know, he's open to negotiation here. The vice president was over in the Senate. He said, this is the bill. When I hear all of you talk, it sounds like you were trying to get somewhere where you can support a legislative product here at the end of the day. But as you just alluded to, Mr. Jordan, you said, uh, you know, and Mr. Garrett said this, uh, you, they wrote this in the dead of night, well, and so on and so forth. And so why would you trust them? Yeah, well, well, Chad, of course we're trying to get somewhere to, to repeal Obamacare. We know what a disaster this has been for the American people. The American people spoke loudly and clearly on November 8th. So, of course, we're trying to get to that point. But I think Mr. Garrett's comments were right on target. 
doing it right is important. Not just doing it, doing it right. And that's what today's about. That's why we're going to introduce our legislation tomorrow. That's why we think the two pieces of legislation, um, that, that mode of getting it done is the proper way to proceed. And that's why we're introducing the bill tomorrow and why we had our bill that we introduced you three weeks what before. Trust, actually, what the vice president said, even though he, is, he said on the Senate side earlier, this is the bill. Yeah, uh, the vice president is, is an honorable man and we trust him. I think what uh, there's some difference in the context of what's being said is I think the president and the vice president is saying that the foundation there is a good foundation. Uh, we might disagree on that. However, we're committed to looking at that foundation and, and seeing how we can modify it, how we can make sure that we look at really repealing fully and replacing uh, the Affordable Care Act in a meaningful way that drives down premiums. And so I don't know that those are mutually exclusive uh, issues as we as we look at that. Ben Jacobs, go ahead. Ben Jacobs. In terms of the current House bill, is that a significant, the current House bill, is that a significant enough improvement over the status quo that you prefer that to the status quo? And if it came down to picking between the two, which one would you choose? Well, go ahead. Look, did we promise the American people we were going to repeal Obamacare, but keep some of the Obamacare taxes. Did we promise the American people we were going to repeal Obamacare, but keep and expand the Medicaid expansion? And did we promise the American people we were going to repeal Obamacare, but oh, we're going to start a new entitlement with the fancy name of advanceable refundable tax credits? I don't think we did. I don't think any Republican ran on that platform. So to me, this is pretty darn simple. And that's why our plan makes sense. Repeal it and replace it with something that's actually going to lower cost. But if your plan can't pass, would you rather support the we just, we just We've just started the debate, you know? We, the, 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 the vice president said, we're, let's negotiate, let's debate, let's, have, let's let it happen. So let's let that process, play. that's how the legislative process works. I think the American people might want to weigh in. They don't want to rush this thing. They just got to see it today as well. So let's let the debate unfold and we'll see what happens here in a few weeks. We know what passed two years ago. That should have been the starting point because, uh, you know, we're, we're stronger with the president behind what we're trying to do. So uh, we shouldn't be going backwards from the bill that we passed two years ago. So, yeah, we're going to make this better. We ought to at least get to where we were two years ago. Mr. Are you okay, all go ahead. To vote Just to right, be here, clear, right here. To be clear, uh, all of the members present will vote against the, the Brady Walden bill as written. And this, the follow up is the, uh, Ju the uh, Paul Jordan bill. Will it have provisions to prevent illegal aliens from par participating? You know, we haven't made any formal positions on the House Freedom Caucus. We're meeting tonight. Uh, that will be part of our discussion as we look at this new bill. Obviously, we have some serious concerns. We haven't been shy about the serious concerns as we look at that. And yet, with any negotiation, you look at the trade-offs, what are the risks versus the rewards. And as we do that, we uh, intend to have a, a robust debate among uh, you know, 35 to 40 of us this evening. Congressman, it, it seems that you guys are proposing two different things. On the one hand, you know, Mr. Jordan says repeal Obamacare and then we'll figure out sort of what to do next. But you seem to think that there are changes that could be made to this current piece of legislation well, that would earn your support. I mean, I don't know that they're mutually exclusive. What we're here today, Dr. Rand Paul came eight weeks ago and said, you know, we'll, really what we need to look at is finish the debate on repeal. We need to go ahead and get that done. The same day, he suggested that we have a vote on a replacement vote, understanding the hurdles, the logistical hurdles that you might have. But we've got a number of vehicles. This is not just the first reconciliation bill we have. We actually have two more coming in any phased in period on a repeal. We've got the one that comes right behind this. We have the one that we'll be voting on again next fall. And so as you look at that, there are a number of vehicles. If we're truly looking at reconciliation as the vehicle, there are a number of, of things to do that. But we need to have a sincere debate, go ahead and repeal it. As Dr. Rand Paul said, vote the same day and, and at the same time not dismiss any merits of a bill that's been out, put out there. I applaud the leadership for putting out a bill. We now can discuss the merits. Last Senator, Paul, right here. I ask you to, to respond to that. You did say Go ahead. several weeks Senator, ago right that, that you'd want to see the repeal and right. replacement. 
at the same time? Can you explain the evolution you're thinking? What I would say is there is a great deal of evidence that this is the beginning of the negotiation. And what I would put forward as that evidence is half a dozen members from the Freedom Caucus, half a dozen conservative members of the Senate have been contacted by the White House, been contacted by Tom Price, and are in discussions with the Vice President. So this is the beginning of the process. The way the process moves forwards is they will count heads. If they have 218 votes for what they put forward, that is what you'll get. So the House Freedom Caucus's power and the power of several conservatives in the Senate is to withhold our support and make it better. If they have 218 votes, we won't get any change. That will be the bill. If they don't have 218 votes, there will be a negotiation and conservatives will have a seat at the table. The House Freedom Caucus has enormous power if they stay together, so do the conservatives in the Senate. And it is unknown what the product will be, but I promise you the White House, the Cabinet, and everybody else assumes there's going to be a negotiation or they wouldn't be making all these phone calls and arranging all these appointments with conservatives in the House and Senate, and that's the way it should be. Conservatives want a seat at the table, and we want to repeal Obamacare. Every one of us want to. I still think the most practical way is to separate them, but if they were to remove the objectionable items from their repeal and replace, it would essentially be repeal. So we're, we really are talking about the same thing. Senator, last question over here. Go ahead. Uh, you're talking about how you should first focus on just repealing as much as you can. Weren't you saying earlier in the year, though, that Republicans have to be very careful about doing repeal without a replacement in hand? I'm still saying exactly the same thing. We should do repeal and replace at the same time, just not in the same legislative vehicle. And the reason is, is I still would. If, if the replacement bill that we put forward that has no new government programs, if they would allow that to be part of the repeal effort, I'm for that. So I'm for bringing replacement into the repeal package if it's good stuff. If it's Obamacare light, it makes it worse and that divides us. I think what's been, been put forward right currently divides us, whereas I think there are some issues. Expanding health savings account. I'm guessing almost every Republican in Congress is for that. Put that in the in the replacement and repeal together and we'll vote for it. You know, put health care associations, get rid of some more of the regulatory part of Obamacare. We're all for that. But if you have a new entitlement program, Obamacare taxes, subsidies for insurance companies, it is going to divide us. So we that's part of what we're we're here today is to present that there is a way forward, but the current way forward I don't think is gonna work. Thanks guys. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Is Sergio? First, for more detail, how this is different from the National Health Service.